Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this virtual education session of Healthy Heart, Healthy Brain, and Healthy You. I am Phyllis Kitchens Thurman, and I serve as the Health Links Chair for the Macon, Georgia chapter of the Links Incorporated. I am also the lead for the Women's Heart Health Coalition for the Middle Georgia area. Today, you will hear and receive information concerning diseases that affect two of the most important organs, the heart and the brain. We all know that the heart, that heart disease remains the number one cause of death in the United States and the rate is higher among Black Americans. Okay. We also know that Black Americans are twice as likely than whites to develop Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. The most common is vascular dementia. Today, the Women's Heart Health Coalition of Middle Georgia has partnered with Emory's Brain Health Center Minority Engagement Coalition, led by Dr. Monica Parker, whose family is from Fort Valley, and her program director, Crystal Davis, originally from Warner Robins, Georgia. Again, valuable information will be given about the connection between the heart and the brain, along with steps needed to help keep both healthy. No one can save us but us. Welcome home, Dr. Parker. We have two community resource partners with us today, the American Heart Association of Central Georgia, led by Kelly Mitchell, Vice President of Georgia and Northern Florida, and the Alzheimer's Association of Georgia, Linda Davidson, Executive Director, and Buffy Hankerson, Middle Georgia's Program Director. They will be dropping resources in the chat for you. Now I present to you Tisha Davis, who will introduce the Women's Heart Health Coalition. We're not only friends, but sisters committed to a cause. Yes, we learned that concept of Black female organizations working together from Mary McLeod Bethune, founder of the National Council of Negro Women. Middle Georgia, we're here for you, Dr. Tisha. Greetings, moms. Now we will introduce our partnering organizations. Middle Georgia Heart Health Coalition, Phyllis Kitchen Thurman, Women's Heart Health Lead, Sandra Parks, Women's Heart Health Coalition Co Lead, Cynthia. Reese, Women's Heart Health Coalition co-lead. Sylvia McGee, Women's Heart Health Coalition co-lead. Vivian Thomas, Macon, Georgia Chapter of the Links, Incorporated President. Dr. Tisha Davis, Jack and Jill of America Incorporated, President, Macon Chapter. Deirdre Wilson, Order of the Eastern Star, Grand Worthy Matron, Jurisdiction of Georgia. Dr. Sylvia Moore, Women's Missionary Society of the AME Church, 6th District President. Dr. Beverly Glover, International Association of Ministers' Wives and Ministers' Widows, Macon Chapter, Past President. Tanya Allen, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Macon Chapter, President. Joan Whitehead, Macon Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, President. Stephanie Norwood, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Macon Chapter, President. Jacqueline Mays, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, Macon Chapter, President. Thank you. Tisha. 
continue. Can you introduce um, Karen Greer? Yes. Karen Greer is a longtime Atlanta resident who is well known in the local television market and has a history of hands-on community involvement. She is the past president of the Atlanta Press Club and currently serves on the Board of Governors for the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences. Karen is the recipient of six Southeast Emmy Awards, two awards from the Atlanta Association of Black Journalists and a Salute to Excellence Award from the National Association of Black Journalists. Karen is a member of the Magnolia Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, a charter member of the Greater North Atlanta Chapter of Jack and Jill of America Incorporated on the board of Pebble Tossers Inc. and a member of my sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, just to name a few. Throughout her career, Karen has been the recipient of a numerous awards, honoring both her professional work and community contributions. She has consistently been named one of Atlanta's 100 Women of Influence by the Atlanta Business League and featured as a powerhouse in who's who in Black America. Atlanta, rather. Karen is proud of her work helping thousands of women find their best cancer early by, excuse me, let me start that sentence over, please. Karen is proud of her work helping thousands of women find their breast cancer early by doing breast self-exams and getting mammograms. It is my pleasure to present our moderator for today, Ms. Karen Greer. Honey, thank you so much, Soror. I'm proud to be here. Uh, you don't ever have to read all that stuff about me. I told Crystal, do not read all that stuff. I'm excited to be here uh, as I am in Atlanta right now, but I now have a tie to middle Georgia, as uh, Crystal knows, and my Soror Phyllis knows. My son works in uh, Macon at WMAZ TV. So I'm trying to let him know the importance of just getting in the community there and letting people see him and give him some of the stories that are happening there. And one of the biggest things that, you know, we talk about is health and what's going on with our health in our community. We tend to brush things aside and not take care of ourselves. So we want to make sure that doesn't happen this morning. I was torn on what to wear. Should I wear pink or green or red because it's breast cancer or purple because we you know want to talk about brain and alzheimer's i figured i'd stay since it's february stay with having a healthy heart as we are doing here today so i want to without further ado introduce you to a woman who is really making a difference and doing big things and that is dr monica willis parker uh, she's a graduate of fisk university of nebraska and she joined the emory school of medicine she's going to kill me for rounding this up almost 30 years ago. So that shows you, she has been doing her thing. Uh, we are so proud of just all the work that she's been doing in clinical research. Uh, she is now leading the Minority Engagement Corps. That's one of six cores for the Emory Guzueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So join me in welcoming my dear friend, my link sister, uh, a woman who needs really no big introduction, Dr. Monica Willis Parker. Thank you, Karen, and thank you to the ladies of the Middle Georgia Heart Coalition. Um, my task here today is to introduce you to the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and also to introduce you curse, in a cursory way to our speakers. Uh, the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center is one of more than 30 Alzheimer's disease research centers funded by the National Institutes of Health, i.e. your tax dollars. And our mission is to uh, study and un better understand what goes into the evaluation, diagnosis, treatment, and management of Alzheimer's and related dementias. Not only do we study the disease, but we also study how this disease may affect caregivers. And right now, as you've been learning in the news, we're at the forefront of looking at certainly preventive strategies to prevent Alzheimer's, but also 
definitive cures or treatments. As of this moment, we only have one FDA approved drug dedicated to treating Alzheimer's disease and relate Alzheimer's disease in particular. There are a number of other drugs in development, but none of those have been approved by the FDA yet. But more importantly, what you will learn as you go through this program today is that all dementia is an Alzheimer's. And one of the things that disproportionately affects African Americans is the preponderance of chronic comorbid conditions like hypertension and diabetes and the subsequent development of vascular disease or strokes and dementia. So our purpose here today is to kind of tie those things together for you, but also to introduce you to resources there in middle Georgia where you can seek to find a definitive place where you can get the same kind of diagnostic evaluation that you would get if you came to Atlanta and came to the Emory Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. So again, we're most grateful and appreciative of the efforts of the ladies of the Middle Georgia Heart Coalition and certainly Ms. Phyllis Thurman Kitchens, who's been a good advocate and friend of ours for years, um, basically getting the sororities and churches in, middle of, uh, in Atlanta to help support our research efforts. So she's bringing what we've been doing in Atlanta to you in Middle Georgia, and we're certainly appreciative of all of her efforts. Our task here today, aside from collaborating, is to kind of, our job was really to secure some of the subject matter experts. You have Dr. Jane Morgan, cardiologist and inventor, but she's also director of the COVID task force for Piedmont Healthcare, one of the largest healthcare systems in the state of Georgia. She's wearing her cardiology hat here today. Dr. James Law, Assistant Professor of Neurology and Director of one of the Clinical Core Directors and um, Principals in the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. He's the Principal Investigator of some, our longitudinal study called the Emory Healthy Aging Study, which kind of follows people who are healthy as they age to see how brain function changes. And Dr. Harry Struthers, who is the chair of the Department of Family Medicine at Mercer University, but he is also lead for the Georgia Memory Net there and Macon through Navicent Health. And finally, Dr. Jimmy Smith, who is director of the Macon Bibb County Health Department. So it is our pleasure with the Association and Financial Assistance of Biogen Company, a grant that we got from Biogen, to collaborate on this educational program. Again, thank you, Georgia, ladies of the Georgia Middle Heart Coalition for inviting us and giving us an opportunity to collaborate, to inform you about how to make better health for your heart, for your brain, and also provide you an opportunity to participate in research for Alzheimer's and related dementias. This time I turn the program back over to Ms. Karen Greer. Thank you so much, doctor. Now, it's exciting. You all have a panel of experts here that you could never really get all together on a stage, uh, either in middle Georgia or in Atlanta. So this is amazing. Some, some things we like about actually having this COVID protocol because it makes us sit down and get things done in other ways. And we, I am so proud of uh, Soror and Link sister, Phyllis Kitchens, uh, for just figuring out how to make this work and do this and involve so many of you in the community. So we could have been doing a whole lot of other things on this Saturday. We are excited that you are here joining us to learn more and to be a part of what is going to be historic. It's, it's amazing what we're going to be able to do here today. So let's just begin. You've, you've heard who all of our panelists are. I want to let everybody know if you have questions. I see some people are already saying hello and, and welcoming uh, us here. Put your questions in that chat. Uh, you can go into the chat, it's at the bottom of your screen or on the side, depending on how you have your computer uh, set up. And you can just type in your question and it will get to me to ask to one of our panelists. Ready to go? Let's do it. I uh, wanna welcome Dr. Jane Morgan, as you heard, a cardiologist from Piedmont. She's really, you'll see her on television, uh, around different areas, but you can also see her nationally because she does a lot of CNN uh, telling people what's going on. And, and we realize with what's been going on with COVID and some people it's affected their hearts. So this has really been amazing to see 
all the research she's done, she's written books, she's a published author, she's uh, really set up and, and part of the state's COVID task force. So let's just start with you, doctor. How do we protect ourselves? You know, in, in, in the African-American community, cardiovascular disease is a big issue. And now on top of this, you know, many people are getting vaccinated. Some are seeing some signs of problems with their heart. Can you talk to any of that? Yeah, absolutely, Karen. It's always great to see you. Always a pleasure and always enjoy sharing the stage with you. I find it to be quite an honor. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have uh, prepared a, a presentation today. So let's see if it uh, will come up. Um, are you all able to see that? Not yet, but you have been yet. Oh, hopes. And while she's setting up, let me just say, she has an amazing son as well who is in this business at CNN. Uh, you may have all seen him. He is a superstar, just like mom. So we are so proud of, of all the work and how you have really gotten him into this business as well. Thank you so much, Karen. So am I able to share my screen? Has it passed over to me? Yes, ma'am, you've been made a co-host. Okay, perfect. All right, so let's see. There we go. Perfect. All right, so um, uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Jane Morgan, and as uh, Karen has introduced me, um, I lead the COVID task force for uh, Piedmont. And um, one of the things that, uh, that I've done this year is developed something called the Stairwell Chronicles, where I literally sit on the stairs of my house. This is actually me sitting on my stairs. That's my house. And I really talked with you in 60 seconds uh, or less, and I answer one single question about COVID or the COVID vaccines. I've done over 100 of these episodes. Uh, last week, I devoted it because it was February Heart Health Month. I devoted it to cardiology, which is why I was wearing red. On Monday, I'll be doing an entire Stairwell Live segment about heart health and COVID-19. Today, I'll speak briefly about it. If you're interested in hearing more about it, feel free to register. You can follow me at Dr. Jane Morgan, Twitter, Instagram, uh, or reach out to me, and I'm happy to talk with you about it. When we look at chronic medical conditions with COVID, if you had a chronic medical condition, you obviously were at a higher risk of complications, these comorbid conditions. If you had a heart disease and COVID, you were six times more likely to be hospitalized. And once you were hospitalized, you were 12 times more likely to die than someone in the hospital with COVID without heart disease. During this COVID pandemic, we've seen more than 50% of our entire population gained weight. That's almost everybody. We gained weight, snacking, reduced physical activity because of our enclosure during this pandemic. We also had delayed medical care, mostly clinical clinic visits were missed, imaging visits were missed, lab tests, treatment. All of this impacts um, not only our health, but when, all, when this pandemic is said and done, the real toll of this pandemic is yet to be determined because we have missed and delayed so much medical care, including cancer care, which I won't talk about today because we're talking about cardiology, um, that's something to, be, to think about what is the true toll, what is the true death rate and morbidity of this pandemic. When we look at cardiac time delays or, car or cardiology, this is the heart, we see that the FMC, the first medical contact, so the time that you first contact a physician or reach the hospital in comparison to when you first had symptoms was increased. There was an increase in that time from when you felt sick and when you actually reached out for medical help. We know that the longer your time to presentation and also to revascularization, meaning when you can get to the cath lab, if you have a blocked artery and we can open that artery, is linked with a higher risk of cardiac death and arrest. In fact, every 30 minute delay is postulated to increase your relative risk for in-hospital death by 20 to 30%. When we look at health equity, CDC lists Five inequities that push, put racial and ethnic minority groups at risk of getting sick, discrimination, healthcare access and use, I just spoke briefly about that, occupation, educational income and wealth gaps, and housing. 
and we look at this pandemic misery index. Think about how this is named the misery index. And we're trying to understand what's happening in America. In the United States, 80% of our population list any hardship at all during this pandemic. 48% financial insecurity, 37% high stress, 37% COVID discrimination and experience, 36% psychological distress, on and on, including food insecurity. And who do you think is suffering these the most? Although we see few residents have really survived this pandemic unscathed, hardship has not been equally distributed. And the pandemic misery index reveals the negative impact of COVID-19 on American lives, especially, especially Blacks and Latinos. When we look at clinical trials, clinical trials is an area where I spent a large part of my career. I reduced it to a single slide here. I have given an, an entire conference on clinical trials. So appreciate this single slide. COVID-19 has caused an unmatched disruption in clinical trials because of lockdowns and the challenges in recruiting. We already, as a group, African-Americans don't really participate in clinical trials. By and large, white men are recruited and enrolled into these trials and drugs and devices and vaccines and therapeutics that are approved by the FDA are approved with that data. And then when these drugs come into real use and they're prescribed to us for the first time in our doctor's offices, any side effects or untoward effects that we're going to have, we're having them outside of the safe cloister of a clinical trial where physicians and nurses are overseeing you. We're at Disney, we're on the soccer field when we're having our side effects. We have to begin to understand that clinical trials not only offer access, they offer maximal medical care. I challenge that we receive optimal medical care when we see our physicians and we are treated to the highest level of medical care available by the FDA. But if you're not being treated, offered a clinical trial and you've got a chronic medical condition, then you are being treated optimally, but you are not being treated maximally. And we have to begin to move past the Tuskegee experiment and move away from exploitation towards representation. And that's all I'm going to say there, but I have a lot I can talk about. My career is based on that. So maternal health and heart disease. Let's take a quick look at that. Preeclampsia. You may or may not have heard this term. Sometimes people call it toxemia. Is 60% more common in Black women. If it's untreated, can lead to complications, even death for the baby. Black women are more likely to develop preeclampsia and experience poor outcomes. So what is preeclampsia and why am I talking about it? This is high blood pressure during pregnancy, protein in the urine developed after your 20th week of pregnancy, and it complicates three to 6% of all pregnancies. Risk factors, you develop high blood pressure during your pregnancy. You're older than 40, less than 20, you're a first time mom, your sisters or other female family members have developed preeclampsia, you're overweight, or you have kidney disease or high blood pressure. Eclampsia, Eclampsia, not preeclampsia, is the complication of preeclampsia where you also then develop seizures. Why am I talking about this? Black women born in the United States have a higher risk of developing preeclampsia than any other group in this country, including Black women who immigrated to this country. Symptoms, headaches, blurred vision, inability to tolerate bright light, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, urinating small amounts, pain in the right upper abdomen, shortness of breath, tendency to bruise easily. Why am I discussing it? Because the factors that predispose women to preeclampsia are also found in the profile for cardiovascular disease. In fact, we now know that if you develop preeclampsia during your pregnancy, you are at risk of later cardiovascular disease and heart failure. Pregnancy for women is really our very first stress test. And so if you have developed this during pregnancy, you have in fact failed your first stress test. And after the baby is delivered and mom and baby are safe, you must be 
referred to a cardiologist for long-term management and care for prevention because your risk of developing heart failure and cardiovascular disease subsequently down the road is now exponentially higher than other people. And Black women suffer from them from this uh, the most, and we have the most risk factors. And again, these risk factors are the same as the cardiovascular risk factors. Far more likely to develop heart failure uh, and complications. Um, and so I'm going to end there. I had 10 minutes to just kind of blow through that. Uh, here's what my sterile chronicles look like. If you follow me on Instagram or Twitter, uh, you see the questions below, pick a question that speaks to you, click on it, I'll talk to you in 60 seconds or less. Very layman's terms, I break down the science, make it very conversational, and I don't take up a lot of your time. If you don't like what I've said, it's over in 60 seconds, right? You can't be that mad about it. Um, and don't forget, I will be expounding on a lot of what I'm talking about today in greater detail this Monday, 7 o'clock. Feel free to register, Steer Chronicles Live. I appreciate being asked to come today. I know we went through that really quickly, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before we go to Dr. Law, I've already got a question for you, Dr. Morgan. If someone has a history of three heart stents and increased lipoproteins, should they take extra precautions to protect themselves against COVID? Um, absolutely. And, you know, that is a good question about lipoprotein. So I don't know if you mean LP little a, but I'm just going to jump right into that and say that you mean LP little a, because so little is known about this particular lipoprotein, but it exponentially increases your risk of death. And we see it higher in the black population. Novartis is the company that is studying that and doing, again, clinical trials. If you get an opportunity to enroll in an LP little late trial for lipoproteins, please consider it very seriously. Cardiovascular disease not only will increase your risk of uh, hospitalization, it also will increase your risk of death if you were to contract COVID. Cardiovascular disease is a serious comorbidity and it absolutely increases your risk. Awesome, thank you so much. All right, Dr. Thank Lala, you. you may remember some of uh, what uh, we heard about him, but graduated with honors from Duke, uh, subsequently uh, enrolled at medical science, scientist program fellow at Ohio State University where he earned his MD and PhD. Uh, he right now is a big part of the research and what's going on over at, the, over at Emory as uh, he is part of the Emory Neurology family. So let's let him give you some information about what he's gonna talk about today, Dr. La. Thank you, Karen. And, um, and thank you all for um, inviting me to participate. It's a real pleasure and an honor to, uh, to do so. And I loved um, many of um, Dr. Morgan's comments. I'm gonna echo some of those. Uh, because of how important um, the, uh, the research activities are in terms of creating breakthroughs. And before I even get started, let me just say, Dr. Parker alluded to um, a, a breakthrough drug uh, that was approved by the FDA last year. And it was, uh, it's very controversial and there's a lot we don't know about it yet. But one of the things that is so striking is the data that was used to approve that drug um, was based on very large clinical trials in which uh, over 1,600 individuals were treated with high doses of this drug. And, uh, and, and so the, uh, the FDA is basing its decision based on those studies. Out of those 1,600 individuals that were considered as data points for that approval, guess how many were African-Americans? Six. Six total out of 1,600 and what that really means is that we have no idea whether this drug is safe or effective in black folks. Um, we, we know a lot about it in white folks, but we just don't know about it in black folks. So that, um, just, that thought came to mind as Dr. Morgan was talking. Um, and so I just wanted to make that comment. And then I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. I created some um, for this and, um, and what I'm going to do, I've actually created things a little bit differently. I'm a, I usually talk about Alzheimer's and talk about dementia illnesses and brain health, but I'm gonna focus this really on uh, connections between brain health and cardiovascular health because of the, uh, the nature of this webinar. 
But just to get on the same page, um, in my clinic activities, when I'm seeing patients and I'm giving diagnoses and we talk about different entities, we talk about mild cognitive impairment or MCI, we talk about dementia, mild dementia, moderate dementia, severe dementia, we talk about Alzheimer's disease. And I see different reactions from my patients when I use these terms. And nobody likes the idea of having any kind of cognitive impairment. So you're not so good about mild cognitive impairment. Dementia gets a little bit you know, scarier. But then when, you, when somebody hears the word Alzheimer's, um, it's like the bottom fell out. So let's understand what we're talking about when we're talking about these terms. So what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Dementia or mild cognitive impairment um, is not a disease. They're just describing symptoms like I have a mild headache or I have a severe headache. The difference between talking about Alzheimer's versus dementia or mild cognitive impairment or memory loss or anything else is um, those are the symptoms and Alzheimer's is one of the causes. So you can have a headache because you have an aneurysm that's about to rupture. That's a terrible headache. Uh, people describe that as the, uh, the worst headache of their lives. Or you could have a headache because you're Tiger Woods and you're a bonehead and your wife took a seven iron upside your head and that'll also give you a headache. Um, but having a headache or saying my head hurts doesn't tell you why it hurts. So saying you have memory loss or dementia or mild cognitive impairment doesn't tell you why you're having those symptoms. And Alzheimer's disease happens to be the, uh, the most important cause of uh, dementia, memory loss and dementia in older adults, but it's not the only one. There are many others, some, something called Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia. These are all um, different causes that are associated with different changes in the brain uh, that can cause decline in memory and other um, cognitive and functional abilities. And, um, and the problem with all of these diseases is that they get worse over time. So when somebody has mild cognitive impairment or early memory loss, it may be very disturbing and it may be annoying, um, but people at that level, at that stage, are still functioning at a very high level, maybe enjoying an excellent quality of life. I have patients who've been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment who are still practicing law, running businesses, um, functioning at a really high level. The problem is that with Alzheimer's and other degenerative brain diseases, it doesn't stay that way. And so over time, uh, the symptoms get worse, um, functional limitations become uh, more, um, uh, more serious. And in the late stages of dementing illnesses, Alzheimer's and other dementing illnesses, that's the image that people typically have when they hear the term Alzheimer's because we've known um, family members, loved ones, friends, acquaintances who've suffered from these diseases and in later stages of those diseases, it's pretty, um, pretty daunting. It's a pretty unpleasant picture. Um, but what, what we think we're going to do in terms of curing Alzheimer's disease, I don't think we're going to take somebody who's in a nursing home and bed bound and never fix them, make them better. However, I absolutely believe that I will see during the course of my career disease modifying therapies so that we can intervene in these um, diseases to prevent and slow and delay the development of disease. Because remember, for Alzheimer's disease, people are typically developing symptoms in their 70s or 80s. And so if we can slow the development, prevent the development, delay the development, and then slow the progression, um, if you, you know, get run over by a bus or you drop dead of a heart attack when you're 95 or 100 and you're still functioning pretty well, you know, that's a win. Um, that's a, we're all, I think that's something that we could all agree um, is an effective um, treatment and cure for Alzheimer's. And I think we're going to get there. And one of the reasons, oh, actually, before I do that, those, uh, there were a couple of um, comments that already have come up. And, uh, and it is really important to understand some of the disparity in Alzheimer's and dementia burden. So we know this is a huge problem for everybody um, uh, worldwide. And in the United States, the CDC estimates, estimates that without more effective treatment by 2060, um, there will be 14 million Americans affected by Alzheimer's disease. But just like heart disease, COVID and other conditions, there are significant disparities in the impact of Alzheimer's uh, by race. 
So um, if you just look at the population of individuals over age 65, the CDC estimate, estimates that about 10% of non-Hispanic white individuals over age 65 um, will have symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. When you look at um, individuals of African, uh, Af among African-Americans and Hispanics, Hispanics may be 20% or more higher, and African-Americans have the highest. Um, the, uh, the risk of Alzheimer's disease in those over 65 among African-Americans is 14% versus 10%, so at least 40% higher, and other estimates um, think that this difference, this, this uh, disparity may be even greater. So this is, a, uh, this is a major problem for all of us, um, but an even worse problem, a more serious problem among African-Americans. So one of the major advances that has happened in the field of Alzheimer's is that we've come to understand Alzheimer's as a, um, as a chronic condition, no different from uh, heart disease or any other chronic condition. And, um, and the cardiologists know well, and I think most of you know well, that, um, that heart disease is not something that happens overnight. Um, the blockages in your coronary arteries, somebody had a question in the Q&A about the Widowmaker. Um, the, uh, the blockage in the left anterior descending artery doesn't happen overnight and, and you have your massive heart attack. Um, that builds up over a period of many years and decades and ultimately, when the blockages uh, of the vessel become severe enough, then your heart, does, heart muscle doesn't get enough oxygen and, and blood flow, uh, and you suffer chest pain and may have, suffer a heart attack. We now all understand that Alzheimer's disease is no different. Um, the, uh, the pathologies, these things that you see on the left here, these amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles, these are things that we see universally 100% of the time. If we look in the brain of somebody who suffered from Alzheimer's disease after death, obviously, um, the, uh, we will see evidence of plaques and tangles in their brains. What we now understand is that these plaques and tangles are building up and accumulating over a period of 15 to 20 years before individuals start to develop any memory loss and progressive dementia. So there is this long silent period of disease during which things are happening in the brain that we, we're still trying to figure out, um, but that happens way before uh, symptoms have started. And so this offers us a, a window. This is an opportunity to uh, approach this disease as prevention rather than treatment, because we, we should all appreciate that preventing disease uh, or treating it early is much easier and more effective than treating it late. So, um, so a couple of things, um, and a lot of people would like to know, what can I do to reduce my risk of Alzheimer's disease? And, and we know that there are a lot of major risk factors. Aging is far and away the most uh, important. Um, uh, gender, unfortunately, I know the most of the participants in this webinar today are, are ladies, women, and um, two thirds of people living with Alzheimer's disease today are women. And the, uh, the reason for that um, sexual disparity uh, is not yet fully understood. So there are a lot of risk factors associated. And I, I like to tell people that if you really wanna avoid getting Alzheimer's disease, I can give you a guaranteed formula to dramatically reduce that risk. You just have to do two things. One is you have to be highly selective in your choice of parents. And two, you can't live to be old. You do those two things, I can almost guarantee you you're not gonna get Alzheimer's disease. Obviously, that's not always possible. It's not, <laughs> it's very difficult to select your, um, your parentage from uh, before, uh, before you're born. But there are things that we can do um, that can reduce our risk. And there's been a series of reports um, published by the Lancet Commission, um, which is really important. This doesn't get nearly enough attention because as I mentioned, prevention is really where we're gonna win the battle against a lot of diseases. And, um, and what the Lancet Commission um, did was they reviewed uh, lots of information about um, ways that, uh, that dementia, Alzheimer's and other dementias could be um, reduced, the risk of those things. Education, we've always known um, at the level of education or in particular, um, the failure to achieve a significant level of education uh, poses a significant increased risk of dementia. So the, uh, the take home there is stay in school, damn it. 
Um, and that's in early life. And I, and I went back to double check what they defined as early life. So um, just to frame this, or, um, the, uh, the commission defined less than age 45 as early life, and then uh, 45 to 65 as midlife, and then older than 65 as later life. And in midlife, um, there are a number of factors that appear to be significantly associated with um, risk of dementia that's potentially preventable. So don't bang your head against the wall and, uh, and you know, um, uh, think twice about playing professional football. Hypertension, um, excess alcohol, and I was kind of happy to see that excess alcohol was 21 units a week. That's, that's three good drinks a day. Um, so don't do that. Don't drink more than that. Um, hearing loss, obesity, these are things during midlife uh, that will increase, uh, that potentially could be impacted to reduce your risk of dementia. And then in later life, these things that we um, know about, um, smoking, depression, social isolation, inactivity, exposure to air pollution, that's a new one that was added um, in, uh, in 2020, and that uh, on diabetes. And some of these things speak to um, uh, social determinants of health that uh, are rightly receiving a lot more attention in Alzheimer's field and in other areas of health. But what this adds up to is if you add all those things up, up to 40% of dementia could be prevented um, based on this very rigorous calculus. And so these modifiable risk factors, especially those things related to cardiovascular health are critically important at reducing this. And then um, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, Dr. Parker mentioned the Emory Healthy Brain Study. And what we're doing here is we're taking middle-aged individuals, fit, most people in their 50s uh, and 60s, and doing longitudinal evaluations of cognitive measures, cardiovascular measures, brain imaging. We collect blood and spinal fluid from these volunteers. And we do that in order to uh, apply uh, modern technologies to, uh, to better understand how we might be able to predict disease. And the whole purpose for the Healthy Brain Study is to answer two simple questions. Am I gonna get Alzheimer's disease? And if I'm gonna get Alzheimer's disease, when am I gonna get ill? Because as these treatments evolve, being able to answer those two questions will tell us who do we need to treat. And some of these treatments may be potentially risky. And so we don't wanna expose you unless um, it, uh, it, there's a good reason to believe it will be beneficial. And in all of our research activities here at Emory, we have focused with Dr. Parker's leadership on trying to increase the diversity of our population. And the, the Healthy Brain Study, so far we have um, 1,500 individuals who have gone through this process. We ultimately plan to enroll 3,000 individuals. And the numbers, um, with a concerted effort, the numbers of African Americans has uh, crept up. So we're now a little bit over 15% of our cohort. Uh, but we really want that to be 33% of the cohort. So by the time we get the full cohort size, I want 1,000 African Americans participating in this study so that we know that the things that we discover from this work is going to be equally applicable across um, uh, racial and ethnic groups. So that's all I've got. Um, and, um, and I will end there. Um, I had to throw this in because of obviously what's been going on in the world. Um, but thank you all so much for the opportunity to speak with you. It's a real pleasure. Dr. Law, thank you so much. A uh, couple of the questions we've got right now. One is, is it possible to recover from alcohol related dementia? So, you know, alcohol is a really interesting question. Um, a lot of the real hard data about alcoholics and alcohol associated um, brain diseases is really related to nutrition. But we do believe that excess alcohol consumption can induce some toxicity. Um, but, you know, when I, was a, when I was a kid, when I was in college, and maybe we drank a little bit more than we needed to sometimes, we talk about purging the weak brain cells. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, the chronic effects of alcohol exposure, um, I think, is something that can be reversed, just like smoking cessation, um, just like you know, weight loss, um, these things that have a detrimental effect on your long-term health, um, those um, injuries can be recovered with sufficient time. Now, both you, Dr. Law, and Dr. Morgan talked about the fact that there really aren't a lot of African-Americans in these studies. So one of the questions I'll give you, you this First, Dr. Law, why are African Americans excluded from clinical trials? Is it that we aren't made aware of them or we don't volunteer for them? 
I think it's both, um, a little bit of both. Um, you know, I've been, um, I think that one of the things, um, one of the one of the things that um, that people who do clinical research, and especially some of these larger trials that are sponsored by big, uh, big pharma, um, they're going for the quick win. They want to enroll as many people as quickly as they can. And what we've learned, um, Dr. Parker and I and our team have learned um, over time, is that Black folks are absolutely willing to participate. Um, they're willing to uh, to do things. Um, they're willing to have spinal taps. Um, these are things that um, uh, that is no different between um, you know non-Hispanic white participants and uh, African American participants. However, it is absolutely true that there are, for good reasons, greater hesitancy in certain populations. And so um, the way that we um, have been successful is by establishing relationships. Um, I know at least three different sororities are represented um, among leadership in this meeting. Um, so we've spent a lot of time with um, sororities and, uh, and the support of sororities with links with um, a number of, of large Afri uh, African-American churches in the metropolitan area so that the members um, see us, they know us, they know we're not just here to, to ask for something, take something without giving something back. So that long-term engagement is essential. And the reason that, um, uh, that um, African-Americans are underrepresented across all research areas is that people aren't given the opportunity to establish relationships. And, uh, and, you know, and we just need to fix that. Um, we just need to make that a concerted effort across all of our research enterprises to make sure that everybody is represented. Dr. Morgan, you mentioned the Tuskegee experiment as one reason that African-Americans, Blacks are just afraid to go in and do these things. What do you think is the biggest issue? And so I think the biggest issue is there hasn't been any other information provided to the community in 50 years. The last we heard about clinical trials was the Tuskegee experiment, right? And clinical trials have moved on to something else. There are multiple reasons, many spokes in this, re in this wheel. If you think about 80% of African-American population in this country is seen by an African-American physician, that's a lot of power in these physicians, but 99% of all principal investigators in trials are white. So of course, you now have just removed 80% of the demographic. If you think about the connection of African-Americans with these large, large medical centers, many of us graduate from medical school and go and serve our communities. We are not in large medical centers. So that removes us as well. We have drug companies that are not recruiting African-Americans into research. And then you have to remember that African-Americans as doctors like myself also come from this culture. Even though we've gone to medical school, we still come from the culture where research is somewhat taboo. It's not something that is completely trusted. And the fact of the matter is even our training in medical school is very biased and tainted with racism. It's a difficult um, path to go through because even medical school is very racist. And so when we look at all of these things and put them together, then we can understand why there's a dearth of participation. We don't have cultural congruence. We don't, we're not recruiting the doctors that actually take care of us, that trusted voice that Dr. Law is talking about. Who do we trust? The number one reason that Blacks see Black physicians is trust. Imagine that we are the only group that selects their doctors based on where we feel safe. That's what we select first. Imagine that. No other group selects their doctors based on that. Quickly, I'm going to give you guys a minute apiece for this one. Uh, so we can get to our next presenter. Uh, is there any recent research study linking brain fog secondary to coronavirus that it could potentially cause some vascular dementia? Um, for me, I, I will say, you know, certainly we look at brain fog and this long term, and I would just say the jury is still out. We don't really know. NIH is, is doing now a really big study. They've just started it, taking a look at it. And so that's an answer that's probably coming. You know, Dr. Law can add to it. Um, um, but we certainly don't have all of the pieces to that now. COVID is, is obviously an exercise in ongoing learning. And if uh, science has taught us anything, we always knew that to be a doctor, to be a scientist is to be a perpetual student and to love being a student. And COVID has taught us that. And anybody in this profession who didn't love being a student 
than really has suffered during COVID. And so this is a great example of, we don't have the answer yet, we're looking for it. NIH is doing a big study, um, so we'll see. Dr. La. Dr. Morgan, as long as that doesn't mean that we had to love COVID, I'm, I'm good right. with it. <laughs> I think Dr. Morgan is exactly right. It's too early. Um, the Alzheimer's Centers Network nationally are actually all collecting information right now on COVID exposure and illness, um, but it's going to take years for us to really understand the long-term impact of COVID, brain fog, long COVID, and what that might mean for dementia. Well, there's so many more questions for both of you. We wanna keep the program moving on time. One of them, and, and I just want everybody to know, you can, they're, they're sticking around, ask your questions in the Q&A or the chat for Dr. Morgan, Dr. Law. One of them, I will tell you, I wanna look in and see what you say is, is there, uh, are there any vitamins that can help your brain function? So if you answer that in the chat, that would be great. All right, thank both of our physicians here, our doctors, our researchers, our friends for getting us on target, getting some of our questions answered. Really great information there, I love that. Um, and we are going to now move to the next half of our program and, and get uh, our next doctors up. And that is Dr. Harry Struthers, Georgia Memory Net, joining us to chat about what he's going to present and get your questions. So as he's talking, you can start getting your questions into the Q&A. Dr. Struthers, thank you so much for joining us. Your, uh, just the information that you've provided and just what you've done in the community is absolutely amazing. Chairman, professor of the Department of Family Medicine at Mercer University. School of Medicine. Uh, you've also been at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. So you have had a wonderful career in this field. I'm sure you have seen a lot of things that will make us just kind of stop and take better care of ourselves, I would hope. Dr. Struthers. Thank you. Uh, I hope so too. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, actually I talked to AJ yesterday. Um, so he is doing an excellent job in the middle Georgia area. Um, what I'm gonna talk about is Georgia Memory Net and uh, Dr. Law is connected to that uh, and actually does some of the administration of that. And um, one of the things that a number of people had the foresight to look at is what Dr. Law was talking about is how many people are going to end up with Alzheimer's in Georgia if there aren't any changes. And those people will require care. Uh, even if we don't come up with a uh, cure, we still have to take care of them. So what has been established is a statewide network of memory assessment clinics. And um, they address all different kinds of uh, dementia uh, and they help primary care physicians make that diagnosis. We have one of those clinics in Macon at the Family Health Center. But let's first talk about again what Dr. Law talked about a little bit Brain health is connected to heart health. And he mentioned it a little bit in his slide, uh, but diet and activity recommendations are the same for heart and brain health. So a Mediterranean diet has been proven to help with heart health. It also helps with brain health. And that encourages fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, and heart healthy fats. What it recommends is that processed foods, added sugar, and refined grains be restricted. It also recommends activity so that the recommendation is that you get 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity. So walking to the point where you can talk, but it's a little bit of a struggle to keep a conversation. Uh, people do gardening, people do other kinds of activity, but getting those minutes of activity every week. Or you can do 75 minutes of high intensity activity weekly. And uh, 
Some people run, some people do elliptical, some people row. So there are other kinds of activities that can get your heart rate up and keep it up. The thing that I would add to what he said is learning new things also enhances your memory. And then he also mentioned protecting your head uh, for brain health. So if you play sports wearing a helmet, if you ride a motorcycle, make sure you have a helmet. Uh, so those types of things help to protect your brain so that it functions as you get older. We'll go on to the next slide. So the Georgia Memory Net is a statewide program that's de dedicated to the early diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease and those related dementias that Dr. Law already mentioned. Uh, it's funded by the Georgia Department of Human Services and it's supported by Emory University. Emory University hosts and manages the technologies that help us keep track and help us diagnose those patients. It's got five sites. Uh, one in Macon is at the Family Health Center at Eisenhower Parkway. Uh, there's a site in Columbus, a site in Augusta, a site in Atlanta, and a site in Albany. Each site coordinates care with the local Alzheimer's Association, the Area Agency on Aging, and Aging and Disabilities Resource Centers in those areas, and helps refer both the patient and caregiver to figure out what resources are appropriate for them and how they can make use of those resources. There's a workflow that we've developed uh, in the Georgia Memory Net. Uh, and why don't we go to the next slide and we'll show you that. So it starts with your local healthcare provider. So your physician, uh, the person that you trust to take care of you. And that person screens for dementia. So they do some testing uh, to help find out how well your brain's working. When they find that it's not working as well as it might, uh, they will usually do some tests from their office. And if they find out that there's evidence of dementia, then they'll do a referral to one of our local centers. There's standard information that we request ahead of time, so we're not wasting your time and we're not repeating things that are already been done. So we'll get that from your primary care provider. We'll schedule an appointment with that person and we'll usually ask that they bring somebody with them, a caregiver, family member, whomever that knows them well and is going to be supporting them. So they get that information, we make an appointment, we do a comprehensive evaluation and diagnosis. And that includes some um, cognitive testing, some advanced cognitive testing that will help us figure out what kind of dementia you may have. It also may involve an MRI or some other diagnostic tests if they haven't already been done. Once we have that information, we meet with the patient and their support person, and we go over all that information and explain it in terms that they can understand. Once we've explained what the diagnosis is, then we help them develop a local care plan and then incorporate that back into information that goes back to the primary care doctor and those community services that they think uh, they'll most likely need. And then we do a handoff to that primary care provider making sure they get the information to help support the patient and they know what the diagnosis is and they know what diagnostic tests have been done. And then that patient and their caregivers 
will get continued care from their primary care provider, the person that they trust the most, and the local services. Uh, that primary care can provider can consult with us if there are other issues that come up that they're not comfortable handling. Uh, but we have handed that patient back to the person that they trust most in taking care of them. Uh, and that's, that's the process for the Georgia Memory Network. And I'm ready for questions. Okay. We've got a couple still coming in. I was gonna go on and introduce uh, right now, Dr. Smith, Dr. Jimmy Smith, who's also here with us to talk about uh, just some of what he's been working on. Uh, his health foundation and health began with an undergraduate degree in biology and chemistry from Johnson C. Smith uh, in Charlotte. Uh, he has really worked with the state, doing quite a few things to kind of connect the community, the state with what needs to happen when it comes to medicine. And so we're going to let you take, take it away, Dr. Smith. Okay, thank you uh, so much. And thank you to not only the organizations in middle Georgia um, that, have, that are hosting this today, but everyone that is um, certainly participating. I'm looking at the number of participants and the number keeps going up. And that's a that's a wonderful thing. Uh, I'm going to see if Ms. Davis, can you put the slides up or you need me to share them from my screen? I'm going to make you a co-host to share from your screen. All right. Let's see if I can pull them up. Give me one second here. Let's see. There you go. All right, um, just a, a few slides that I wanted to uh, share with you as we talk about this, this topic. And then certainly, how do we deal with this from a uh, public health uh, standpoint? So there are three things that I really wanted to hone in on, which I think really summarizes the, the information we've received from Dr. Struthers, Dr. La, Dr. Morgan. Uh, but from a public health practice standpoint, the areas I wanted to cover are certainly health conditions, health behaviors, and then I think it was Dr. Lott had mentioned those social determinants of health. So though I'm a, a, a residency trained family physician, I work in public health practice. Um, and I joke sometimes that I probably have the biggest practice in town. Um, so when you're looking at Bibb County, I've got 157,000 people that I'm responsible for. Um, and they don't schedule appointments. They don't necessarily want to come see uh, a public health physician or someone at a public health practice, but we work behind the scenes to certainly support the work that Dr. Morgan, Dr. Law, Dr. Struthers do, not only in our own communities, but around the state. So if we look at health conditions, as we talk about a healthy uh, heart, healthy uh, brain, um, healthy you, one, um, the four that I wanted to hit under uh, health conditions deal with addiction, diabetes, overweight and obesity, heart disease, and stroke. And the, the little sub points that you see under those are our goals that we uh, are, are trying to achieve through what we call Healthy People 2030, which is our public health kind of Bible document, um, but it's the public health agenda for the nation uh, for the next uh, 10 years. So when you start looking at addiction, we certainly want to reduce drug and alcohol addiction, but we also have to put that in the context of there are more than 20 million folks in the U.S with a substance abuse disorder, and most of those folks are without treatment. And certainly early in the discussion, we've talked about um, uh, alcohol and then vascular disease and how that certainly goes in with um, certain points of dementia. In terms of diabetes, we certainly wanna reduce the burden of diabetes and improve quality of life for those that have it, but there are more than 30 million folks in the US uh, with diabetes is now listed as the seventh leading cause of death in the U.S. And many of those, we have many more people that are in a pre-diabetic stage. Um, so we certainly here in our offices sometimes, I don't have 
Most folks won't use the word diabetes. They'll use, I don't have sugar. And, and if I think I have it, I only have a little bit of it. Um, well, that's like somebody saying, I only have a little bit of food on my plate as I'm watching the food drop off the plate. Um, so with that, we certainly need uh, that to uh, uh, reduce the burden of diabetes because it does have an impact on your vasculature uh, throughout your system. Heart disease and stroke, uh, certainly reducing the deaths uh, from both of those. Heart disease, we know, is the number one cause of death in the U.S. Stroke looks at, at number five or comes in at number five. But certainly, if we can control the risk factors for hypertension and elevated cholesterol, both of which were mentioned earlier, then certainly our risk and goes, goes down. And then finally, overweight and obesity. Nearly one in five children and two out of every five adults in the U.S. have obesity. There are many others uh, that are overweight, and we certainly need culturally appro appropriate programming that will help our, our community move forward as we start to tackle all of these health conditions, which are certainly tied to a healthy brain, healthy heart, and a healthy you. In terms of health behaviors, some of these have been mentioned before, uh, particularly Dr. Struthers mentioned nutrition um, and, and healthy eating, certainly increasing our number of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and certainly decreasing the number, uh, the amount of sugar uh, and fats uh, that we take into our system. And keep in mind, that is not only through food, but that can also be through drink. So particularly here in Georgia, uh, there's hardly any restaurant in this state that you will walk in and they will not offer you sweet tea before they offer you water. That's going to happen if you're in Georgia. I once traveled to, I was headed out to Kansas City, stopped at a restaurant, and they said, we'll bring you some tea. And it was unsweet. And I, I, I knew I'd left this planet because I was like, that, that's not how we do things. Um, but certainly keeping in mind not only what you ingest from food, but your, your liquids as well. Physical activity, um, looking at, at ways to improve our health, our fitness, regular physical activity. And as Dr. Struthers said, it doesn't have to be joining a gym. It could be walking. Um, many of us, I am been guilty of this. I'm trying to do much better. If I have to run to the store to get something, we'll drive around for five minutes to find that parking spot. We could have been in the store and back if we just took that walk across the parking lot. Um, I see folks that'll get in the car, drive down their driveway, get the mail, and then drive right back to the house. Can we walk to the, to the mailbox? Can we garden? There are other things that we can do. You would be surprised how much physical activity we take out of our daily lives because we think it's inconvenient. Um, I'm just, but that you're calling too many of us out. You're calling too many of us out now. I'm, 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 it's a two-way street. <laughs> I'm stepping on my own toes, too. Um, preventive care. Um, far too, too often, and we see this more so in, in women, the, the, what we see particularly in the African-American community, the, the, the mom, the grandmother takes care of everyone else, but doesn't go in to do that preventive care. So we're talking about immunizations, uh, cancer screenings, uh, even oral health care has an impact on a healthy um, you. And many folks don't realize in public health, there are areas around the, the state of Georgia, particularly in the metro area. And now I'm proud to say that we have this back in Macon, is we actually have an oral health center housed in the health department with two operatories for a, a dentist and a hygienist. So uh, reaching children and, and adults. And then finally, also tobacco use. And I'm not just talking about cigarettes, but I'm talking about all forms of tobacco, whether they be traditional or they be uh, electronic. And, and with that, we have a great resource in the state of Georgia called the Georgia Tobacco Quit Line, where we can refer folks for help if they want to um, and need to stop using any form of tobacco. But there are other ways that we can address uh, tobacco use, like smoke-free policies. Uh, nearly 80% of our schools across the state of Georgia have a 100% tobacco-free policy, meaning that no form of tobacco, traditional or electronic, can be used on a campus uh, 365 days a year, 24-7, including those uh, that are learning there, teaching there, or visitors to the campus, inclusive of athletic events, as well as the vehicles that they use. So there are ways that we can address this. We can increase the, the tobacco tax. 
And we certainly can promote our health education campaigns that are addressing uh, tobacco use. And then finally, those social determinants of health. And this is where I'm so glad to be participating in this, this discussion today, because this is where I think the coalition of organizations that have come together uh, to talk about this important topic can be of such a help um, to those, whether or not you have a medical degree or not. And in this case, I think it's even more important to not have the medical degree. So when we look at those social determinants of health, what is it that affects our health that doesn't necessarily have to do with the illness per se? So let's look at economic stability, wanting to make sure that folks earn steady incomes that allow them to meet their health needs. If folks don't have the money to come into the office, and I think Dr. Morgan said this first, we are a group that one, we're going to where we feel safe but we also don't wanna be a burden to anyone else. So when sometimes when our families don't have the money, we don't go in. Um, so knowing that 10% of the US lives in poverty, 10% of the US citizens live in poverty. Here in Bibb County, where Macon is located, nearly 30% of our kids live in poverty. And it's over, it's a little over 50% of African-American families in this county live in poverty. So it, it then begins to make sense why folks are not going in if you say, well, I don't have the money to pay for that. And pride is a wonderful thing, but pride can also be a barrier. So we need folks to come in, even into the places like a public health system, where in the state of Georgia, you cannot turn a person away based on their ability to pay. The second one, um, I'd like to look at healthcare access and quality. So increasing that access to comprehensive quality health services. When there is access, you also need to make sure that there is quality. Just because the door is open may not be what you need on the other side. So make sure that that quality is there for the care that you need. One of the goals we have in our local health department, because I'm, you know, I'm from the, a small town in North Carolina with three stoplights. So I, I'm, I'm country and regular. We have the ABCs. Our staff must be accessible, they must be believable, and they must be competent. And those three cannot be unlinked. If you're at work every day, but you're not competent, then you're in the wrong place. So we wanna make sure that the care that you're getting from your physicians, any of your healthcare providers, is not only comprehensive, but is quality. The last two neighborhoods and the built environment, creating neighborhoods and environments that promote health and safety. If you're in neighborhoods and you're like, you know what, I'm dealing with overweight and obesity and I need to walk, but there are no safe places for me to walk. Um, our parks close, close by. We can control what goes on in our built environment. We have to be part of that discussion. And that is a big part of what public health um, does and needs to do in partnership with you as we move forward. And then finally, that, that social and community context, Increasing social and community support, it matters what relationships you have. It matters what interactions you have. It matters when you, have, when you face discrimination. And when you have to face uh, challenges or dangers that you can't control, that has an impact on your stress level. That stress level has an impact on your cortisol level in your system. And that begins to then have an impact on vascular disease. So I will... will Close with these two things. This is uh, information about, you know, healthcare in our local area in terms of what we do uh, from a public health perspective, and then also listing many but not all of the services that we offer. Um, but I would say, as we look at a healthy heart, healthy brain, healthy you, and public health practice, kind of as a wraparound to all that's been talked about today, there are certainly programs you can be involved in, and we've talked about clinical studies and other things. But I think where our organizations can have the biggest impact is when you begin to address policy, system, and environmental change for the folks that are in our community to then ease that journey along their healthcare continuum. And that healthcare continuum doesn't start when you become 35 or 40, it starts at birth. And that's where I think the programs of organizations can be a huge, huge help. So cognitive decline can start at birth. So let's begin addressing it at birth. I love it. Thank you so much, 
Dr. Struthers, all right, let's get to questions for both of you. Uh, some people want to know, do other states have programs similar to the Georgia Memory Net, and why are there no locations in North Georgia? Good question. Yes, there are some other states that have similar but not identical programs that uh, to what Georgia has as a Georgia Memory Net. Uh, I believe we're still unique in the Southeast, uh, though I don't think another, another state has started the type of program we have in the Southeast. Um, the question about North Georgia, I believe is partially because of where the um, academic centers are in Georgia. So in each of the places that we have a memory uh, assessment clinic, uh, we have residency programs, so we have medical schools uh, there, uh, which were places to, to start looking for groups that could do those kinds of assessments. Uh, and there just hasn't been there uh, until recently uh, in North Georgia. So there is uh, a growing academic medical community, medical community in, in Gainesville, for instance, uh, that uh, started a couple years ago and started after we started the memory net. Uh, but if you look at the state, we're mostly located where there are clinicians who can do those kinds of services. Well, this is all, as I, I'm seeing some of the participants say, this is all cutting edge information. So we thank all of you for being a part of this this afternoon. Uh, this is the first time I think, Dr. Smith, I have heard anyone mention um, tobacco even being electronic. So there were some concerns and some questions as to does, does that mean, is it okay to vape? So could you please answer that one? Uh, sure. As a, as a public health professional, what I will say is any form of tobacco as we know it today, um, no is not, not safe to use. That is not to say, because science evolves and research continues, that there will, that there may be a safe way to use tobacco or a safe use of tobacco. But the way in which we use it uh, here now, no. Whether it's traditional use of a uh, cigarette that has been rolled, cigar, pipe, smokeless tobacco, or whether it's delivered through an electronic nicotine delivery system, or what we call ENs, it is still nicotine that is entering the system, but it's not just nicotine. There are about 3, 000, more than 3,000 other chemicals that are part of uh, that tobacco product, and you're taking that into your system. So I, I use this example that I used to use with my uh, children when they were, were small. If you're riding in a car down the interstate, we'll say Interstate 75, and you start smelling tobacco smoke. And you're like, no one's smoking in the car. But you look at the car in front of you and someone's holding a cigarette out the window. Anything that is that strong that I can go down the highway, I'm not gonna speed, so I'm going 69 miles an hour. And I can smell it in the car behind me and it irritates me that much. Is that something that I really wanna put in my system? Good, good point. Very good point. Uh, question, do you believe the BMI is an accurate measure of obesity for African-American women? A uh, person says, I find it a bit unrealistic. I do too, because I can never get past 30. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll, I'll take some, yeah, all my colleagues look like they want to get quiet on this. <laughs> I'm going to take the first shot, but I want, I want some help. Uh, I, we do use uh, BMI, which again is a, a proportional measurement of height, weight um, for, for men and women. There are some instances where the BMI numbers may not be correct. Um, and that is if you take someone that say is a very high level athlete with a, with a, a good deal of, of muscle uh, mass and, and the BMI numbers, the numbers may not be interpreted uh, the same. The other side of uh, that is, is most people don't like to hear their BMI numbers, but that is what we use right now to determine if someone is underweight, normal weight, overweight, 
or obese or morbidly obese. And particularly in the southeastern U.S., you find more states where you have folks that are obese or morbidly um, obese. It can be unrealistic, uh, but I think what is also becoming unrealistic is how we've normalized being overweight. So with that, when you believe that it has an, an impact on all other things that you do, knowing the relationship between being overweight and obese with cardiovascular disease, as well as being a serious contributor to diabetes, um, then we all, and I'll start with me, um, need to lose a, a pounds through proper nutrition, physical activity, preventive care, to, so, so that we can lower our BMI. And I'll add to that, um, if you don't mind. So, uh, you know, when we look at sort of uh, our ancestors, you know, in, uh, in Africa, um, prior to the last 50 years, uh, before availability of more processed foods and access, we really don't see um, uh, people who are overweight. And so, you know, the question that you're asking is the body type of black women and do we tend to be curvier? Do we tend to have um, larger curves and bigger thighs? And therefore, you know, has this, is this metric really built on a biased case? And so the answer to that would be yes. And I think I talked briefly about clinical trials. They certainly didn't look at us when they were making those measurements. Again, please be involved in clinical trials and then don't complain about a BMI index later when you didn't participate in providing the information. So let's just think about that. So here's the information as it is because we didn't participate. So this is the BMI. I think it is a, at least a good guide for something that you should try to achieve even if you're at the top level of normal, you're still in that normal range. So being at the top level of normal, I think takes into account maybe heavier bodies, but let's also have some responsibility for why our bodies are also heavier. It's not just the type, it's the foods we eat, it's the exercise we're not getting, okay? It's the excuses that we are making. Let's have some, let's take some responsibility for ourselves. Let's not just say, um, I, don't, I don't really like that BMI. I think we're bigger. Everybody, all my friends are bigger. Well, why is that? Maybe that's where we should start. Why are all your friends bigger? And why are we normalizing that? And so I do think there's something to be said about body types. This is the same for black babies when they're born. Again, if our data is not submitted when they are making these calculations and formulas, right, we are part of the problem. This is what I'm saying. That's a great example of that. Dr. Parker, I know you wanted to say something about that. Well, I didn't want to say, I wanted Dr. Morgan to comment because, you know, I give the talk of I'm big boned and right. I'm not big boned. And <laughs> is there a difference between fat and muscle mass. And I think that we have bodybuilders who are like, I'm not fat, I'm 90% lean. So I'd like Dr. Morgan to give us some instruction about what's the difference between having fat fat versus muscle fat and how that affects our hearts, particularly among young athletic or middle-aged African-American men who really get into bodybuilding. Sure. So fat, fat floats, right? Muscle is dense and it sinks. And so when, when you look at that, when we talk about this, these striated muscles, the heart is also a striated muscle like other muscle groups. We actually want to move towards lean muscles, including the heart. We don't want a heart that is padded in a lot of fat. And so if you are, and I won't take muscle, I'm not going to look at uh, uh, weightlifters and muscle builders because, you know, it's unclear whether they're just taking all types of other hormones and things. Let's just talk about a, a, another athlete, maybe. You know, I don't know what any of them are doing, actually. So let's just say tennis players or runners or, or whatever. And you exercise chronically five, six hours a day. You watch your meals. You've got coaches managing you. And you have almost no body fat. Because this is somebody else. This is someone, again, who's an outlier to the BMI. Even though their body is not overweight, their muscles are so dense. 
and so lean that their BMI is going to be higher and they are going to be an outlier. The BMI though, didn't look at these people when they were measuring, right? The calculations and let's not get it confused. This is not, they do don't represent the average American person either. Right. So we have to really think about that. Set some realistic goals for yourselves. I'm not saying that everybody has to fit within this BMI, but you should be able to skim that top number. The top number of the BMI you should be able to skim that one. And that should be your goal. That's not necessarily unreasonable. And I think if you take a look at yourself and your lifestyle and all of your friends, it may be that all of you need to have a, a rethink and a readjustment as to what we need to do to live healthier lives. I love that. Love that, Dr. Morgan. And as Do Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice says, it's not your weight, it's your, or it's not your weight, it's your waist. She likes people to just measure your waist. You know, people are so concerned about the scale and, and what the scale says. Dr. Struthers, before we go, I, I really had a quick question for you. I know sure. um, this has all come to you Personally, if you're still there, do I see him? Yes. Okay. Personally, uh, can you can you just expound a little bit about uh, how uh, Alzheimer's has affected you personally? Sure. Uh, my mother, who was a registered nurse for years at Howard University Hospital, um, retired, um, but she passed away last January of dementia. Uh, after um, about three years after we um, got a formal diagnosis, but about four years, you know, we knew something was going wrong with her memory. And um, so uh, my youngest brother, Keith, who still lived in the uh, Maryland area, uh, took care for, of her for that last three years. Uh, and she passed away quietly at his home which is exactly what she wanted, which is what she had put in her living will and advanced directives. Um, and she was almost 86 uh, when she passed away. Um, so yes, it, it is personal. Uh, there've been other people in my family that had dementia, but she is the, the most recent and the closest. And um, it means a lot to me to be able to talk to people about their struggles with memory loss and try to help them figure out exactly what's going on uh, and to help them plan for the future. Uh, and again, that's what... Thank you, Froze. So we are going to, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody who is here, all of the panelists. Uh, give yourselves a major round of applause because you were amazing. I'm not going to have that sweet tea today, Dr. Smith. Uh, I'm going to not go to This Is It as I had planned because I just did a big story on them this week. I'm going to bake my chicken. <laughs> but we do. We need to change the way we do everything. We need to get out there. I need to go to the walk. I don't have to go to the gym, but I can go walk. I've got a big hill right out here. So those are some of the things we really need to reconsider and, and just you know, memory things, and, and I am going to get involved in a clinical trial. So I, I thank all of you for bringing that to our attention. And and perhaps in the in the chat, you will see where you can log on to find out about trials that interest you. I also need to tell you all that this has been recorded. Uh, many people were saying, "Oh, this is great information. I wish I could, you know, have it later. I wish I could share it with someone." It has been recorded, and you will get a copy of it in coming weeks as soon as they get it all together. So now would like to wrap things up uh, on this Saturday afternoon and give closing remarks from Joan Whitehead. Good afternoon, everyone. And all I can say is, wow. I am so grateful to have heard and have learned all that I have today about how poor cardiovascular health increases the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and some of the solutions we can make to maintain a healthy heart, a healthy brain, and a more healthy us. 
we know that we in the African American community are impacted most by these risks due to health equity in America. Health hardships we heard today, uh, health hardships we heard today in our black community have not been equally distributed. I've taken plenty of notes and to share and I hope to share with those I love and with those who fall within my circle of influence and I hope you will as well. In our commitment to wellness each day, we have the obligation and the opportunity to identify behaviors we need to stop, to begin new behaviors or habits that contribute to our well being and wellness, and to continue to doing the good work that we are doing as far as proper nutri nutrition, physical activity, learning new things we heard today, and health screening and prevention, including participating in clinical trials. The journey to being and staying healthy is not always an easy one. But we must do what we can while we can. The event today was brought to the Middle Georgia community and was made possible by a collaboration between the Middle Georgia Women's Heart Coalition, which includes the Macon, Georgia chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, the Order of the Eastern Stars, the Epsilon Omega Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the Making Alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, the Making chapter of Jack and Jill of America, AME Women's Missionary Society, International Association of Ministers' Wives and Ministers' Widows, in partnership with the American Heart Association, the Guzeta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and Emory University. Thanks to Mr. Ha Mr. Alex Habersham for assisting us with the advertisement. We are so grateful to our marvelous moderator, Karen Greer, and our expert panel, Dr. Monica Park Parker. Thanks for your leadership in identifying the experts for today. Dr. James Law, the, the brain health and and heart health uh, discussion uh, outlining the common dementing illnesses, including cognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Jane Morgan, can't wait to view your stairwell chronicles. Dr. Harry Struthers, thanks for introducing us to the Georgia Memory Net that does memory assessment clinics for early diagnosis and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And our own Dr. Jimmy Smith, who has the largest practice of patients who don't make appointments and for identifying for, for us health conditions and the social determinants that impact them. You gave us food for thought. Cognitive decline begins at birth. Thank you all for sharing your time and your expertise. And I also wanna thank all of you who logged in to learn today to get this cutting edge information. And we just ask that you go forth and share what you've learned today so that more of us in our community can enjoy the benefits of having a healthy heart, a healthy brain, so that we can be the healthiest version of ourselves that we can possibly be. Knowledge is power. Thank you. Awesome job, everybody. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, Crystal. Awesome job with you as well. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate it. Dr. Smith, you're great.